Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Game Telecom video, we're going to be discussing and analyzing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. This is going to be a very AMD centric video. We're going to be starting things out with the Ryzen 5 2400GE and the Ryzen 3 2200. GE. These are low power APUs, so we're going to be discussing the specifications in just a few moments. Then we're going to move over to something a bit different on the AMD side. This is going to be software related and a collaboration with Valve. That's right, AMD and Valve are collaborating to show the world AMD True Audio next generation support for Steam Audio. We'll go into that in a moment. And then finally, we'll discuss the reviews and the performance of the Ryzen 5 2400G and the Ryzen 3 2200G. So we're going to be looking at a variety of different benchmarks and just trying to decide whether this processor slash APU is the right one for you, particularly in an age where, let's face it, graphics card prices are just a little bit crazy. But we'll start things out, as I just mentioned, with the 2400GE and the 2200GE. So, these are essentially APUs which have a considerably lower TDP. Um, we're looking at a TDP of just 35 watts here. It was ASRock who inadvertently confirmed the existence of these low power APUs. And what we have here is essentially parts which are just pared down variants of their bigger brothers. For example, the Ryzen 5 2400G runs at 3.6 gigahertz, that's with a two megabyte cache. On the other hand, the 2400GE runs at just 3.2 gigahertz. And this, of course, is a Raven Ridge core. A similar situation with the 2200G then, and it's running at 3.5 gigahertz. And once again, we're seeing just 3.2 gigahertz with the 2200GE. Now, there is some ambiguity regarding turbo clock speeds. It's either disabled or they've simply not actually told us what it is. So your guess is as good as mine on that one. One thing that is rather interesting is that according to AMD's own naming schemes, the part should actually be referred to as GT. So it's a bit weird. Maybe they've decided to change the name at the last minute or whatever. This part, of course, is going to be excellent for when low power situations are required. Probably not necessarily something that a lot of enthusiasts are going to be interested in. But, for example, if you're looking at uh, streaming device, that type of thing, then certainly this could be a rather interesting part. So in a slightly different piece of news... Let's discuss AMD and Valve, who have announced AMD True Audio Next, also known to its friends as TAN, support for Steam Audio. So for those unfamiliar with Steam um, Audio, it's Valve's cross-platform developer tool for VR spatial audio. There are a plethora of things that this thing does, and you can check them out on the Steam community uh, website, but they do things like binaural um, rendering, occlusion, physics-based reverb, time, real-time sound propagation, and many other things as well. For example, this is very important if you're playing a virtual reality game simply for the immersion factor. <laughs> immersion is, with visuals anyway, pretty easy to comprehend. If you turn your head to the left and look up, guess what? You want the display to do similar. But you also don't want latency, right? If, for example, there was half a second delay for sake of argument, when you were to look up and to the left, it would kind of ruin the immersion, just a little bit. But audio is kind of as important. If you were to turn your head to left, and this is giving a basic example, you would assume that the audio coming from the left side would become stronger, and you would also be able to just naturally assume that the audio is coming from, you know, behind you and you would perhaps be able to also understand that the audio would sound slightly different on your right ear compared to the left ear. And also, it would also change considerably based upon what the angle was compared to other objects. For example, how audio was to sound next to glass, or perhaps to sheet metal, or to wood, or whatever else. By the way, if you can hear a small jingling sound occasionally, that is because Amy's cat Bonnie, I'm around Amy's house at the moment recording while she's at work, Amy's cat Bonnie has decided to jump into my lap and she is really not going anywhere, trust me. And every time I've put it down, she just leaps back, so it's the reality I'm living in, damn it. I'm embracing it. Uh, baked in reverb and propagation is also quite important, it can reduce CPU load. Now, 
baked in um, lighting, pre-computed lighting is very uh, popular when it comes to static scenes. So in other words, a light source which will never change its light source. Um, that's oh, sorry, the illumination or the angle of direction of the light. So for example, let's say a static walking scene where you're not able to necessarily interact too heavily with the environment, you're just walking through it. You can basically just have the, well, the artists would basically just uh, calculate that ahead of time so that your system doesn't have to um, calculate every single ray of light on the fly. But that can also be done with audio as well. And for more linear experiences in particular, virtual reality, for example, horror games, where you're on a fairly linear path and you're not necessarily going to be able to approach an object from a thousand different directions, this would be even more handy. Because once again, it reduces the requirements of the processor of the CPU, which means that they can essentially reduce the specifications needed to play a game. Okay, so let's get into the actual piece of news now, right now that we've set the stage, if you will. So AMD and Valve have announced this collaboration, and what it allows developers to do is to leverage the audio processing capabilities of GCN-based AMD GPUs. And it is really part of the True Audio slash Liquid VR initiative. Now what's rather interesting about this is that developers can decide to leverage the actual compute units of an AMD GPU up to about 25% for audio processing. So in short, if you were to, for example, have a graphically intensive scene, the developer could decide to, well, not leverage this. Instead, they might decide to offload it to, let's say, the CPU or perhaps not really utilize those functions quite so heavily. But in a less technically demanding scene, then perhaps they can utilize this for the GPU. It's worth noting that audio processing is considerably more taxing than what many give it credit for. And while it's easy to use the visual medium of graphics, after all, it's very easy to simply imagine, hey, if I go from 1080p to let's say 4K, you're asking the GPU to process four times the number of pixels. Well, it's kind of more difficult to visually imagine how audio sounds, I'm uh, sorry, how audio would um, punish your system, but when you're dealing with large amounts of reverberation and you're dealing with large numbers of sound samples on top of that high bit rate, dealing with num large numbers of sound sources, so for example, let's say you're going through a forest trail and there's perhaps animals, um, you know, ru running past you, there's there's leaves rustling, there's perhaps an owl flying above you at the same time as perhaps there's a, a babbling stream to the left, perhaps there's a snapping of twigs going off in the distance, perhaps even maybe a crack of thunder, and perhaps as well there's lots of rocks around which are obviously um, causing the sound to bounce around like crazy. You can imagine just how much work that is for the system to calculate. Anyway, so this is going to TAN can be supported with a various different uh, applications, including FMOD Studio, Unreal Engine 4, Unity, as well as the Steam Audio C API. Okay, so now let's take a look at the Ryzen 5 2400G and the 2200G. Most of this video, I'm going to focus on the 2400G because I feel that for my audience anyway, this is probably going to be the processor of choice for many of you. Um, but I will also mention a few 2200G results as well. So essentially what we're going to be doing here is identifying, is this worth purchasing? Are these processors worth purchasing for you? Now, at the end of the day, I want to get this right out of the way. This is not going to rival an Xbox One, PlayStation 4 type of system. These are more in the range of, let's say, the RX 550 in terms of graphics performance, or perhaps a GT 1030, maybe slightly better than that. But you're kind of getting where I'm going with this. If we were to look at the 2500, sorry, the 2400G, for example, it has four cores, eight threads, uh, up to 3.9 gigahertz with the max boost clock on the CPU, 11 Vega CUs, uh, 1250 megahertz they run at, and finally, four megabytes of level three cache. So typically, a Ryzen 3, 5, and 7 processor, a CPU for the desktop anyway, is built on a dual CCX uh, CPU complex design. We've discussed this in depth before, but each Ryzen CCX is 
um, four cores, that means that typically cores are disabled for, let's say, the 1600 processor, just for the sake of argument. These chips, however, aren't designed like that. Instead, you have a single CCX design. Now, there are some trade-offs. While latency is certainly improved, and we also have a more aggressive clock speed, turbo clock speed, and we'll get into that in just a second with Precision Boost 2, you do have a trade-off with fewer GPU PCIe lanes. You've only got times 8, and the amount of cache is also reduced as well. Uh, as I just mentioned, you've only got 4 megabytes of level 3 compared to the traditional 8 megabytes. AMD also employ Precision Boost 2 here, and what this really does is not impose a lower clock speed limit if more than two CPU cores are being used. Instead, Precision Boost 2 assesses whether the processor is within specifications and will continue to boost regardless of the number of cores until the maximum clock speed is reached that is printed on the box or they notice that it reaches another limit. So, for example, a temperature limit or whatever else. This means that, in theory at least, you should get a smoother transition on performance. And this is really handy for applications that, or tasks in general which sw switch between perhaps one or just two threads and then multiple threads. So, for example, let's say you've got some lightweight application running in the background. And then, let's, for the sake of argument, say that your antivirus or something else... Uh, requires the attention of the processor, well, it's not going to suddenly just crash in performance now because multiple uh, threads are being, uh, you know, uh, hammered. Instead, it should be a smoother transition in clock speed, which is obviously a good thing for users. Okay, enough explaining what has changed. What about the performance as well itself? Well, I'm going to be going into this from a couple of different websites, grabbing their performance results, and obviously I'll say which ones are from which. So let's start out with CPU side of performance first. GIMP from Hardware Canucks, you're looking at the 2400G getting uh, 33, this is completion in seconds, so 33 seconds versus the 2200G, which has 35 seconds, no surprises there. It's not bad actually, it's within the margins of error to be honest with you with the Ryzen 5 1500X, and not that much slower as well than even the Ryzen 5 1600 handbrake. Pretty damn impressive results. Once again, um, the Ryzen 5 2400, you're looking at 400 compared to a very, 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 very fractionally faster uh, Ryzen 5 1500X, which manages to score 395. From Anantech, perhaps one of my favourite benchmarks to test CPU performance, Cinebench R15, both the multi and single threaded. If we were to take a look at the uh, 2400G, it scores 800 points compared to even the Ryzen 5 1400. It's about 100 points faster, considerably faster than the Coffee Lake 8350K, that which only scores 672. On the single thread, however, as you can imagine, AMD is slightly more anemic in performance, with the 2400G scoring just 148 points compared to, let's say, the 7300, sorry, the 7350K, which is the leader of the pack at 176 points. Another fascinating result from BitTech, actually. This one I find rather interesting, and that is the 2400G, which scores 229 points on CPU Z multi thread testing, uh, 2480, sorry, 2482 if overclocked. And that compares very favorably with multi thread uh, performance, anyway, compared to the 8350K, which scores 1836 or 2264 respe uh, respective of stock or overclocked but as expected intel do pip amd to the post here when it comes to single thread performance you're looking at 482 uh, uh, yeah 482 with the 8350k which is considerably higher than the 416 of the 2400g and obviously the 2400g also is slightly faster than the 2200g now, speaking of overclocking, it seems that at least a couple of different websites, Tech Power Up and uh, BitTech, have also overclocked, and a couple of other results as well from the web. The long and short of it is that 4 GHz is quite achievable with these processors, and that's with a fairly reasonable voltage of about 1.45. That obviously means that performance scales fairly linearly, and honestly, that's not too bad. The problem here is the GPU. You're looking at around the... 1300 maybe slightly more depending on the cooler you're using and the you know the wind direction today so it's about five percent additional gpu performance which 
being honest is not exactly going to set the world alight. It means a performance game of just a couple of frames a second in most titles, even at 1080p. So uh, if you're overclocking the GPU, just be pretty much braced for disappointment. What about GPU performance then? Well, I'll go through a few scores. Certainly, just to clarify here, this is not a 1440p uh, capable GPU at all. The best way I can describe this is a GPU, discrete GPU performance of about a GT 1030, around the RX 550 mark, slightly faster, slightly slower, depending. It's certainly not going to put out the GTX 1050 kind of levels of performance. For example, if we were to look at Hellblade from Tech Power Up, the 2400G, I'm going to focus on that just for one second, scores the uh, 32.7 frames per second, that's with um, one gigabyte of memory, 24G with two gigabytes scores 33 frames per second, I'm just going to round this up. This compares very favorably to the GT 1030, which scores 37 frames per second. Another one, once again, from Tech Power Up, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider, an ever popular benchmark with two gigabytes, which uh, manages to score 38.5 frames per second. It's quite close to the RX 550, but still doesn't quite manage to beat it. It's about one frame per second slower and is considerably slower than the GTX 1050. It's putting out mm, less, just slightly uh, better than half the performance. So what about two of the most popular games on PC? Without question, The Witcher 3 and Grand Theft Auto. Can it play? Well, kinda. Yeah, so the Ryzen 5 2400G was slightly overclocked, manages to score in the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. This is at 1080p um, with the astounding graphical quality of low, 29 frames a second. Now, I don't need to tell you that that's runs again within a GT 1030 type of range, and I think you can kind of understand where we're going with this. I'm going to leave you with one final result, and that is Grand Theft Auto 5. At 1080p, DX11, once again, the graphical fidelity of a piece of cardboard, because it's running on low settings, and the 2400G, 2500G, both score around the 75 frames per second mark. Uh, that's overclocked. Default, once again, 71 frames per second. It's not that it's bad, and I know I sound kind of harsh what I'm saying, but... I think you get where I'm going with this now in terms of the level of performance. It is essentially an RX 550 as an APU. Obviously there are some differences and that's really where this comes down to. If you're looking for that level of performance in a system and you were previously considering buying a Ryzen 3 kind of processor and let's say an RX 550 or perhaps a GT uh, uh, 1030 then by all means this is you know this is a good APU but if you are thinking that this is going to be like a PS4 kind of level of uh, performance then obviously not but let's face it this pretty much goes in with the leaks that we've heard all of this time with all of that said I think it's a really nice processor uh, and I think if they did ramp up the the core count in the future uh, as well as the GPU count pretty much you know in the next year or two it's going to be very interesting to see what AMD release and if we will see let's say the equivalent of a PS4 or a PS4 Pro level of APU available for the PC that would be pretty spiffy. With all of that said hopefully you've enjoyed the video I'll see you soon take care bye for now.